started already 20 years ago. Yes, 20 years ago. And um, so actually, uh, most of the, the other uh, organizers got stuck because the airport was closed because of fog. So yes, so we are only few. Uh, the, and um, so I hope they will, they will do it because I mean, one guy had problems, so I am ready to do another lecture. Yes. <laughs> I had to do another lecture for this guy this afternoon and I hope that they will arrive because the way they have to do all the lectures of the school. So, I mean, three lectures is already enough. Um, so, how is the school organized? So, I mean, it's not a job. I will tell you in the, in the introduction. It's not a job because it's like a one has to go from zero to, to infinity <laughs> in five days. Velocity is infinity, of course. And um, so the idea is that in the morning we will do theoretical lectures. And also there, we will try to introduce few concepts, but not everything, because it will be impossible. You need a course. And then in the afternoon, we will do hands on. So you will see those things in practice using Yambu. Of course, during the school, you will see only bits. And it's just, I mean, uh, an invite to just go back and, and learn more. So, but the structure is exactly this. We have uh, theories in the morning and practical lectures in the afternoon. Uh, all developers will be just around. I mean, I'm, I'm staying in this guest house, so whatever you need, just come to us for installation and problems and theory and everything. Just come to us and then we, we can discuss. Okay, so let me open officially um, the school with a small lecture about the uh, perspective on material science that is given by Yambo. So if you look at material science for Yambo, what do you see? Uh, I think that the perspective of Yambo is just a perspective of Madrid's uh, community in the sense that you see all critical aspects and, and, uh, and features and needs and problems that you encounter in doing computational physics. Um, okay, so uh, material science is, oh, no, this is too much words, yeah. Material science is a very large word. There are many different communities inside and actually I'm a theoretician originally, personally. So my background is in quantum field theory, originally. Then I moved to condensed matter. So I come from this part, theoretical physics. And then I started writing the code because I needed to do, I needed numbers, just numbers. Fine. But the point is that along the years, in the last 20 years, the world around the theoretical physics increased enormously. And now there are communities that themselves have an entire literature and research and so on and so forth. Things that are very far from our background. I know about your background of chemistry or physics, but uh, there are things, I, just trust me, in this theoretical computer science, in computer engineering, that I understand nothing. I mean, it's like if someone talks to me in Arabic. No way. But at the end of the story, I have to take care of all this because the codes like Yambo, have been involved in all different communities, in all these communities. This is a really source of a lot of complications for me and also for you as users. I mean, it's not that you install Yambo and then this afternoon you'll be, we will be able to run on 60,000 cores. No way. I mean, it takes some time. It's not straightforward. Okay, so uh, there are different actors in this world of material science. So there are experimentalists, theoreticians, and, and what I say, runners. I mean, so just run on computers. Um, so theoretical physics. This is the sort the, what we will learn in the morning. And the problem is very actually is very very old and very well known. Your Hamiltonian has a body body interaction. Column interaction is not single body object. There's many body objects. So whatever you want to do, you have to take in consideration the effects on all the electrons together. So how do you solve this many body problem? This is, the what this is what is solved in the theoretical part of the story. So you need to find methods like Nancy functional theory or many body perturbation theory or beyond. I mean, we will just tell you about few methods. This is not, not all the methods have been developed. We will not talk about, for example, dynamic mean field theory. We will not talk about that. So we will just talk about the tools and the approaches used by the code. Um, so the first part is, yes, how do we solve it? And then once we find a way to solve it, how do we implement it? So we have some equations to solve 
and then some approximations to do. And moreover, the kind of theory that we want, I'm just giving you an overview, I mean, you don't understand everything. The kind of, of, of theory that you need depends on the physics. It's not that you do theory yourself, I mean, in an absolute way. It depends on what you need to calculate. If you need to calculate current or a voltage or a charge migration or a polarization, an absorption, a gap, you name it, and then we have to sit together and see what is the theory needed to evaluate it. And depending on the kind of physics, you may need to introduce more complex and advanced methods. That can be TDDFT, many body, or even more complex methods like non-equilibrium Green's function theory. This is what I'm doing at the moment, for example. I'm, I'm, I'm working in the equilibrium Green's function theory world. Good. Then, once you write your beautiful piece of code, and this is what it was done myself in 2000. Actually, I started writing. It was not Yambo, it was the name of self. And uh, I did it for my PhD. I, I needed a tool to calculate the numbers in my PhD. But along the years, many people contributed to the code, and it grown and grown. And now we have version 4.5, I think. And, and it, along the years, it got a lot of more things that were calculated with the code. Not all, I mean, we stopped in 2009, so that's still 10 years. There are so many things. And then you can get a clue, an idea, just for the fact that at the beginning, in the first paper that we published, when the code was made GPL in 2009, we were four. Now we are 20. In the last papers we published last year, we are 20. OK, you will see a lot about Yambo. Yambo can calculate several things. I mean, it is feeded by by a DFT ground state calculation. At the moment, we support PWSTF and a binet. So you do your system with those two codes, and then you are ready to, to calculate, to start Yambo. And then with Yambo, you can calculate plenty of things. And, um, and then there are several libraries that they are, they, they are um, released with the code. So in general, we try to use it, to use it at most user friendly as possible in the compilation installation. Even if my student says that this is something that only I, it's friendly only for me. It's true, I mean, but we can do it together. And um, many people, and then actually it has grown in the years, and now it's not only a code, only as a community. So we have, we, we have been doing schools in the last 20 years, and um, Yambo, has, I think, has traveled, I think I, think, I, think I miss, Australia, I think Australia, because China, Japan, Africa, United States, North, South, Europe, I think everywhere. Maybe Russia, maybe Russia. Maybe we miss Russia, maybe. Now for us, we really, well, it has been told all over. And also thanks to ICTP, we participated to many schools organized by ICTP. And, um, oh sorry. There is a forum, there is a wiki page, that is the one you will use to do the tutorials where there is where there are all information about the code. So it's the educational part of Yambo. So there are um, how tos about the tutorials, theories, and so on and so forth. And uh, the source is open and is also in a JIT repository. So if you want to contribute or to get the latest uh, snapshot of the code, you can use If you're able to use JIT, you can use JIT. If you don't know what is JIT, just ask us, we will tell you. And um, it has been applied, uh, I mean, there are around, we are around 60, 600 publications that have been done using Yambo, and uh, they are practical about everything, from molecules to solids, uh, nanostructures, surfaces, actually, I, I don't even know all the system it has been applied to. Um, being a community, it also part, it has several interactions with uh, funding, it has been source of funding and received funding. At the moment, there is in two H twenty twenty projects, and uh, and lately we have been a lot concerned about performance because you know that now computers, as a, in in the material science world, I mean the part relative to computers has grown enormously, and uh, also the technology in computers has grown enormously. So, for example, now the latest machine, and Andrea will tell you more. The lens machine, the most uh, I mean, expensive and fast and enormous at the moment is not only CPUs. It's probably it's an hybrid machine where there are CPUs and GPUs, video cards. You know, the one used for gaming. I bought a PC to do to do <laughs> coding on, Z on GPUs, and my 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 sons that they like they like very much to do Fortnite. 
they saw and said, wow, but this is great to do, to do, to play Fortnite. Because actually we're using the technology developed for gaming, I mean, as Nvidia cards. And uh, so performance is an issue, especially for us that you are traditions. I mean, at the beginning I didn't have any idea what is an, even a GPU. So yes, we are many, we had a t-shirt, even if most of them lost it, but it's t-shirt, yes. And um, so we are many, uh, we had several schools around, and uh, this is the last one I went in Cameroon in last November, and there is this school. Then this year again we will go in Africa again, in Rwanda, in summer. And, but there are many, I mean 20 years there are really many. Then we have educational, okay. Um, just as the last words about the, the performance. So, what makes Yambo sp specific is the fact that among all the codes that were, I mean, when I did my PhD, there are many people writing codes. But at a certain point, where does supercomputers enter in the, in, in the business? Lots of codes did, were not able to cope with it and were not able to run on those machines. Because actually, you need sometimes to rewrite entire parts of the code. Yambo, for some reason, was able to do it. I mean, it was rewritten, I mean, if between version one, two, and three, it was completely rewritten. Then now it's not possible anymore, it's too large. There is no way to rewrite Yambo now. You can rewrite parts, but not the entire code. And, um, and this is possible because the code was modular. I can tell you, I mean, there is also some theory of coding. I mean, it is not that you do coding, I mean, just, uh, that's it. And one of the key things to be able to evolve is to be modular. If you're modular, you have pieces that are as much as independent as possible, then you are most probably to be successful. Um, as I told you, in the years we managed to export Yambo on CPUs and GPUs, and this is the latest uh, development. That, I mean, the latest release only is the first one, the 4.5 is the only one that has been released with GPU support. And then, thanks to the, the, this kind of coding, we were able, this is actually already old result, able to run up to 60,000. But I mean, actually, Yambo at the moment is pretty good in, in performance. We didn't manage to see a saturation of the code. And indeed, in one of the eight projects where this in is a project for exascale transition, how to bring those, machine, those codes to exascale machines. Okay, so again, MPI, and CPUs, you will be told how to use uh, CPUs both as MPI or as uh, OpenMP. There are two different methods to use the CPUs, while GPUs, there is only one method. And this is performance by GPUs. I don't want to run too much about this. Okay, Yambo is pretty much used among the codes in the praise and that are in this H2020 Max project. Yambo is the second after Quantum Espresso. And then, yes, I want to just to say a few words about an, something that for me is really important. I mean, a super, the situation is super complex, right? So theory and coding is a big jump. Then how do we do it? I mean, how do you do it? How do you find yourself, your path in this, in this uh, walk? So I, what I suggest after many years of teaching is that you have to use a, a, a gradual, procedure, but you have to be careful. The idea is here. So you have a physical phenomenon that can be among the ones calculated by Yambo or another one. It's possible that you came here because you want to calculate, for example, change migration. At the moment with Yambo, you cannot have electrons moving in space. Let's talk about that. Then, physical phenomenon, you need to, first of all, read and study. So if you run, the, this, this week everything will be, I mean, just uh, reshuffled because of the time. But when you go back, don't run before reading. It's completely useless. Then you fill the form up with questions that are completely nonsense. So you have to theory, study, and then the simulation is at the end. Because between the theory and the, uh, the simulation, there is one important step. It is discretization. Computers are discrete objects. Computer is not continuous objects. So if you have an integral differential equation, you cannot put it as it is on a computer, you have to discretize. And in this discretization, there is, is the source of most of the parameters. So you study the, the, the phenomenon, you connect it through the microscopic world and through the theory, then you 
understand which kind of numerical methods are used, and then at the end you simulate. So from this, you can get, you can approach in a proper way and some tutorials, understanding the parameters, the way to, to choose them, and uh, I mean, it's important that you understand because there is, in the tutorial, there is more than one example that if you don't change properly the, the parameters, you will stuck the machine. In Cameroon, it happened to me. At some point, people say, oh, my computer does not reply, does not answer anymore. It's completely frozen. I said, yes, because you didn't change that number. So Yambo can kill your machine, yes. Okay, then, oh, then maybe, okay, because then at some point, everyone asked me, what, what, why an oyster? Why it's an oyster? Then, then Yambo doesn't mean anything. So even uh, there was Conor Rogan that, to make a joke of me, said, it, yet another many body code. But Yambo doesn't mean anything. It's just a, uh, I mean, in, in Africa, in some, in Swahili, Yambu means hello. That's all. Why the oyster? The oyster is because when I started writing this uh, Yambu, when I met actually Mita, this one of the founder of, of the code, I was working with vacuum polarization diagrams. I had th those diagrams all around. I mean, I was just crazy with those diagrams for me because I, I couldn't find the solution to the problem. And then I published, I found the solution because I published a paper. But then she turned the oyster, the, the vacuum polarization diagram, the second order vacuum polarization diagram in an oyster. And this is why Yambo is as an oyster. That's it. Okay, so, yeah. That's the easy part. No equations. Good. Now, how is the story? We have in the program, there is already many body. Okay, so do you have questions about this? You have to wake up at a certain point. I mean, just, just to inform you. Okay, so let's go to the to the to the real job. Now we do many body. Okay. Um, what time is it now? Are we on time? I was quick. Okay. Because in general, I'm not quick. I'm very slow. Okay. So let's now do with many body. Okay, so at the very core of Yambo there is quantum mechanics. Now, um, is there any one of you that doesn't know what is a bra or a cat? Uh, just to know, as chemists, I mean, how do you how you are distributed? And um, the chemist just can raise the hand, chemist. Okay. All the others are physicists, is it engineering? Physicists, all the physicists, raise the hand. Okay, so chemists and physics go away. Oh, a very minority of, of chemists. Okay, we'll be an not life for you, I know. I know for the chemists, but I, we will help you anyway. Uh, okay, so, but chemists, I mean, you do brackets, right? Yeah, so, artery fog, yes, artery fog is fine. The problem is after artery fog. After fuck, you go for MP, whatever, we go for, for, for GW. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, but I mean, la let's do now a quick review of quantum mechanics, the easy things that we need for, for Yambo, and then uh, we will introduce many body in a, in a heuristic way, so a simplified way. Mm. Okay, so quantum mechanics make short, 
um, then the many body problem and artery fog. Why artery fog? Because I think the artery fog just can give you a very good insight about the different paths you can take to solve the problem in, in a weakly correlated case. Okay, so um, the problem we need to solve is to create a micro macro connection. So you have your Hamiltonian, that actually this Hamiltonian is, is just the poorly electronic one, but in general there are a lot of, lot of other actors entering the Hamiltonian, like phonons or spins or magnetic uh, fields, electric fields, and so on and so forth. But I mean the, the core of the many body problem is already inside the electronic case. So now you need to find a connection through, between this Hamiltonian and the observables. In this case, there are three observers that you can calculate with Yambo. You can calculate bunch structures, you can calculate width of the structures, positions, optical absorption, including temperature. You can include temperature with Yambo with electron phone interaction. And you can also calculate time dependent uh, uh, quantities. In this case, it's polarization time dependent polarization through many body and also through the Berry uh, approach. How do we do it? That the, each of this somehow is an observable. In the easy cases you can really write it as an, as an operator that can be, I don't know, the current the current and the polarization and also the bands they, they can be connected to averages of operators. So you introduce this space of states. So given the Hamiltonian, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian, the eigenvectors define a space. This is an orthonormally complete space on which you can calculate averages and also time dependent averages. So you can introduce a time dependent operator switched on in interaction and this system will start oscillating and on the basis of these oscillations, you can calculate quantities. Then the very hard job is to rewrite this very compact problem to expand the problem. Because I mean, when you define the observable as an average or an operator, you are condensed as a simple, as super simple, it's just one line. But to calculate it and to discretize it, you have to make it explicit. This is the work of theoretical physics, to write this condensed average in terms of something that can be calculated. One way is through diagrams. This guy is Freeman Dyson, the Dyson equation. And the Dyson equation is a way to rewrite specific case, a specific uh, average in terms of a series of which you can calculate analytically the terms. And then you're done. If you manage to sum this series, you are done. You can really calculate at the end, get a number. That's the point. Now, what is the complicated part about this term? And uh, you will see in a second. This first part, you see, is a summation over the, the electronic states, the electron, the electron, sorry, I is an electron you have an Hamiltonian of the single electron. So this first part represents an electron moving along. If the electron moving, moves along, then the solution is just to find the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. But this is the beast, because it will just feel electrons moving reciprocally. So this means actually that in this room, in independent particle approximation, if some of you will the phone of some of you will ring, the others will not care, will not see, will not hear anything. They will just look at me. Instead, the many body interaction will do in such a way that if your phone will ring, some hands will, some head will, will, will turn. And actually, the heads will turn depending on the dist distance. Unfortunately, the column interaction is really a beast because it's very slowly decaying potential. Very slowly. I mean, there is, I mean, in transfer moment, in transfer space goes like one over two square is even divergent. So slow to be divergent in, when you do the Fourier transform. This is source of a lot of problems. Actually, it's also source of a lot of physics. I mean, nature works. I mean, if you look at nature from, from math, you see that the most 
uh, interesting things in nature, in math, are divergences, <laughs> like 1 over q square. So you have plasmons because of the 1 over q square. Um, okay, so the many body problem is the problem of connecting the eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian to the eigenstates of the single particle part. So we define this lowercase n at eigenstates of h, of, of small h, of single particle part, and at uppercase n, the eigenstates of the whole Hamiltonian. Then again, you have a cat that is a state, and a bra is the adjoint. This is fine, right? Yeah, this is okay. Okay, this is all you know. Yes, and then you also know that if this operator commutate, commutates with the Hamiltonian, then it's stationary, and then the uh, average is just simply the corresponding eigenstate. Good. Okay, now, uh, the easiest way we can do is just, just to neglect the interaction. If we neglect the interaction, then we approximate the Hamiltonian with only the independent particle port. So, in this simple cartoon, the interaction are those lines. Every electron is this yellow sphere, and the interaction are the lines. If you remove the lines, then the solution is trivial, because the uh, state, the exact eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian is the exact eigenstate of n independent electrons. This is just a product of the single electron states. This product is averaged with a function representing the level of excited state. In the ground state, we are all sitting now, in the first excited state, some of you are just up in the air, so it's just a way of counting the, 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 the single particle levels, it's, it's trivial. I mean, if you have a finite temporal system, what would be the weighting function? Sure question, yes. Yes, if you have excited state of an electronic independent electronic system at high temperature, what is the function? It has two names, one is Italian, and the other is, is uh, Iraq, is Polish. I mean, if, if they are bosons, if they are not electrons but are bosons, the function is of the name of a very important Indian guy. Eh? Eh? The boson yes, the boson is for? Bosons. Yeah, for fermions? Fermidirac. Yes, yes, it will be a Fermi-Dirac function. So, dependent particle approximation to excited states in the sense of temperature will be a Fermi Dirac. So, the, the, yeah. yeah. So, in this case, you can rewrite this air complex average as a functional of the averages in the free single particle states. For example, the Hamiltonian of the ground state is the sum of the occupied energy levels. That's it. It's easy. And then you will see that we will show you how to calculate several quantities since it's independent particle approximation. It's easy, everything is practically analytical. And, okay. Then, I mean, one important point then you will see along the, the lectures. Why, I mean, is it always so bad, independent particle approximation? Well, it depends. Indeed, first you have to understand the physics. We go back to the original argument. We have to understand the physics and then compare what you're calculating with what you're interested in and see the level of approximation, unless you don't have formal proofs that the approach you're using is the exact one, you have to use this, uh, uh, let's say, validation with, check with the experiment. You understand more about this. But actually for, I think that 99% of the things that we are going to uh, talk about, we don't have formal uh, justifications. Good. Now, in the real world, the Hamiltonian includes several effects that we will neglect for the moment. Because in the full Hamiltonian there is also temperature, there are phonons, there are also other kind of uh, uh, actors, can be manions, can be spins indeed. Um, and every of this element introduces an additional interaction term in Hamiltonian. So for the moment, we neglect it, Fourier electronic, we stick to the zero temperature. So what I will talk to you today is zero temperature problem, because the final temperature, the, the, the tools change. And also we will use a static Hamiltonian for the moment. We will not introduce a time-dependent field. And we will restrict to the ground state. 
Okay, so in this case, the, the core of the many body problem is the following, as originally introduced by Landau. So you have those three electrons are bare, and then you have the full interacting problem. Is there any way to replace the single actors, the single electrons, with something that is slightly modified but still weakly interacting? So if you want, yes, if the phone will ring, we will all turn our heads. But if the, 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 the person with the phone has an overcoat, you know, or a big pullover that is actually shielding the phone, then the, the, the sound, the music, will be uh, weaker, right? And then maybe only a few persons around will turn head. This pullover is a way to uh, dress the electron. So how do I define and how do I know if it exists such a representation? So in the many body methods, the idea is, from a formal point of view, is to replace this emitania not with the free one, but with the free one with, in addition, a many body potential. It's a single particle many body potential that is not produced by nature, it's something that you introduce mathematically, and then you require this potential to satisfy some condition, to reproduce something of the full Hamiltonian. What? Now we see. Then, with the Hamiltonian, we'll also introduce, in the case of time-dependent Hamiltonian, our time evolution, but this, let me skip it for a moment. No, let me skip it. I will go back to this later. Um, One problem, how do, you, how do you approach this, this problem or define this potential? Who of you doesn't know anything about EFT? No, 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 little. So, little, little. Okay, yes, okay, that's good. Um, all the rest, you know, what is DFT? It's, it's okay, and it's important for us because then if I give DFT for given, then you understand nothing. Wow, only one, only one doesn't know Honenberg cone theorem, would you be able to tell at least what is he talking about? What, Fulvio, Fulvio, my student, I mean, you should know, come on. <laughs> I will ask you later. So, Honenberg cone theorem, who, who has nothing, who, who doesn't know it? No, okay, only one, okay, so you just a little bit, okay, that's fine. So, density functional theory is a method to define this potential, and it's a variational method. So one way is a variational way, and then we will just mention it. But the straightforward method that you will find on a textbook is to use perturbation theory. This is the, the poor man approach. You say, oh, look, I multiply the interaction with a prefactor, and then I do an expansion. I assume that I can expand the eigenstate in powers, and then I define the coefficients in such a way that to a given level of approximation, the two states are the same. This is perturbation theory. If you do with true level problems, you can have, this is uh, the true level independent particle part, then you add the potential that just mixes one and two, two levels, one and two. This is really straightforward, you can do it. I mean, it just do the expansion, you can solve exactly and find this, but then you can also take this, uh, sorry, this thing and then expand the powers of, of lambda when, when you multiply V by a lambda. And then you get that you can expand the exact eigenstates in powers of lambda. Now, of course, in this case, you solve exactly the problem. It's two by two. Then you multiply V by lambda and you do power expansion. Then you say, yes, I could just expand in powers. The, the many body problem is that there's a case where you cannot solve exactly the problem because you cannot solve exactly the full Hamiltonian. So in that case, you use perturbation theory. And perturbation theory is trivial. You expand the eigenstates and then you require the theory, you require the expansion to give this the eigenstate, eigenvalue problem uh, explicit. Then you expand in powers left, right hand side and you uh, compare term by term. By comparing term by term, you find an expansion for the eigenvalues and for the eigenstates. This is the static perturbation theory. And again, using study perturbation theory applied on the two by two level system, you just 
get this expansion. Again, we are not at the point of getting a potential. We are seeing that with, with steady perturbation theory, given a certain perturbation, this will modify the state and the energy, but then you may wonder, where is the potential? Now, to introduce the potential, we use uh, Artifoc. I think Artifoc has, gives, at the end, two interesting uh, concepts that can be used in general, very, very much beyond Artifoc. So what is Artifoc? Artifoc is a way to solve the many-body problem within certain uh, stringent approximations, assumptions. In the case, and then you can introduce Artifoc in two ways. One is with the perturbative approach and the other is with the variational approach. If you do it with the perturbative approach, you, I mean, Artifoc is just easy because you take the independent particle part, then the ground state of this Hamiltonian independent particle part is just a product of states, and the eigenfunction is a Slater determinant, and then exactly like in the, in the two body, in the two level problems, you do perturbation theory calculating just averages, exactly like a static perturbation theory, you go in powers of the interaction, so at the first order you have the correction, and the second order you have the second order correction. Now, when you solve the, I mean, I don't want you to get all the math, because it would be impossible, just get, get the, the, the ideas. You do perturbation theory, then you correct the energies, then you go and look at the definition of the ground state energy at this, in, within this approximation, you see that, again, it's a sum of single particle energies. In Archie Fock, if you do Archie Fock, you do the math, you realize that you can rewrite the ground state energy with the interaction treated at the first order. So you take the interaction, you treat it to the first order, then you realize that your total energy is a sum of single particle energies, but they are now modified. So this change in a single particle energy can be written as an average of a potential. You can introduce the potential in such a way to give the change of the single particle energies within second order perturbation theory. This potential is composed of two pieces. One is this part that we call artery, and the other is this other part we call exchange. The artery part is something you, you should have expected from simple physical arguments. Because the artery part is just a potential produced by the density of a system. Beyond the single particle approximation, where you have only the kinetic part, the first term that appears is just the standard electrostatic potential. This comes out so normally, naturally, in the perturbative approach. In addition, there is another term that is the Fock term. This Fock term is instead induced by the form of your eigenstates, that is later determinant. The B antisymmetric, it just avoids electrons to fill fermions to overfill a single state. So it's not possible for two fermions to be in the same position. So it's Pauli exclusion. What is really important of this approach is that you have, even if within severe approximations, artifoc, we written the many body problem as a single particle problem under a modified potential. Hmm? You can actually re uh, found Archifog through a variational approach, completely different in nature where you actually assume that all the, the ground state of this Hamiltonian will be a superposition of the determinants, and you find this superposition in such a way to minimize the energy. If you do it, you use the, the, the Lagrangian approach, then again, you find an equation for the single particle states of the ground state of the determinant that solve an equation that is the Archifog equation where again you find the artery and the Fock potential. Now, there is a big difference with the perturbative approach. In the perturbative approach, 
the states that enter in the potential itself are bare because it's perturbation theory. So you, you take a system that is non-interacting. With this non-interacting system, wave functions have energies. You build the potential that will normalize the electrons themselves. So you see, this M naught is the bare level enters in the potential, and this potential will change the energy of this bare level. So the change of my energy depends on myself. Depends on myself and depends on all the others. It's a self-consistent problem. So it, again, in the simple uh, example I gave before, in the pullover of the lady, we are all involved in creating this pullover. So, but we must be dressed as well. So we are bare. We build a first version of the pullover for all of us. Then again, with the, now with the pullover version one, we build up another pullover version two. This is a self-consistent cycle that Dr. Fock has built in. It is an important concept because you see that in many body, if you do perturbation theory, you have bare objects inside definition of the potential. If you do with the variational instead, the objects inside the potential are already dressed. So take a more message. In Archie Fock, so you have Archie Fock, and this is Pauli. Um, so in the Archie Fock problem, you have just physically a simple introduction of electrostatic and exclusion, exclusion principle. So not very much, not, not, not very much fancy. But there are important properties that we must take home for going beyond. First is that the perturbative approach, in the perturbative approach, if you introduce artifact with the perturbative approach, energies and wave functions, sorry, energies will change, but wave functions will not change inside the potential. In a variational approach, everything must be found self-consistently. But at again, in both cases, the artifact potential defines a potential, an effective potential that exactly gives the single particle levels that correspond to a variational minimum in a variational approach or to a second order perturbation, perturbative correction in a perturbative approach. Say, now, nah, wow, artifact is great. Then you apply artifact and you get that the gaps of your systems are systematically overestimated. And leading for that, I think, is like 5 EV. You are above of 5 EV. So you are completely off. No way. I mean, but this is something expectable. I mean, actually, chemists will tell me, no, artifact is not so bad. Yes, yes, it's true. If you take a system, it's very tiny, it's not solids. If you take a system that is only a few electrons, then their other effects are important. So in the case of few electrons, then artifact is particularly efficient because um, in that case, what really m makes a lot of difference is the self-interaction. So we have only few, that is how I can explain you. But I mean, anyway, artifact for few, few electrons is particularly much more, more effective than in the case of extended system. For extended system, it's pretty bad. So this means that we are missing something. What we are missing, and this is Feynman, because what we are missing actually is easily connected to Feynman diagrams. We miss correlation. We miss correlation. So correlation is what is missing when you do just our true fork. I mean, also, the point is that physically, now we have problems because how would we introduce a conceptually, in a conceptually simple way, correlation? Now we are just introducing as something that is just missing. Now in the next lecture, we take two minutes break. In the next lecture, I will try to introduce correlation in a simple way, with an heuristic approach, without even without introducing diagrams or something like that. But at the moment, what is important of this first part of, of, of the lecture is that the core message is that in many body, really, the problem that we have to solve is to define in as much as easy possible an effective Hamiltonian, an effective potential, an effective whatever that still keeps my solution, my problem, to the level of a single particle problem. Of course, this potential, I have to be careful because in artifact, this potential, there is no way it is defined by the method itself. When we, we need to this correlation, we need to be careful in the sense of filling this potential with properties that are interesting for our problem. But still, the problem will be to introduce a potential that will embody within some ways the many-body properties 
Okay, so now, what time is it, Andre? Sorry? 10 20. Okay, now, I, I don't want to do a 40 minutes lecture. Um, I, I prefer to do smaller lectures, so we will do correlation after this. And um, now we'd like to have uh, discussions. So if you have questions, if you don't understand anything, um, if you want to rest five minutes, this first part is done. Also, so in this way I think you would be more awake. So if you do like one hour lecture, in general also me after one hour lecture, after the, I just decay, I just sleep. Then with the 20 minutes, then. Yes, yes. I, I Okay, yeah, sure, it's there, I mean. Oh, Andrea, can I tell you even more? Andrea, you want to comment on the self-interaction? Oh, Andrea is an expert. So, the, the sense of self-interaction, there are, uh, as far as I know, at least several definitions in the literature. Um, in the, oh, yeah. I think that, that there's a very uh, different case for what concerns density functional theory and many body perturbation theory and uh, in a sense the case of many body perturbation theory is somehow easier since uh, uh, if you have uh, Feynman diagrams somehow you, you see exactly what happens uh, uh, there in the electron electron interaction. Uh, by this I mean that typically so if you start from uh, uh, expectation values of the um, electron electron interaction operator, which has four uh, field operators, you end up with direct and exchange terms that, when applied to same uh, uh, single particle uh, state, basically would cancel out. So, somehow, in this respect, uh, R3 FOC is prototypical. You have the cancellation of uh, uh, the R3 term with the exchange uh, uh, term. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and somehow, so one of the definitions of self-interaction is exactly when you go to higher uh, levels uh, or higher orders of theory, the fact that in some cases you miss uh, some of uh, these exchange diagrams that may cancel out the corresponding uh, direct diagrams. And this is exactly what happens, by the way, in the GW case. So in the GW case, you have uh, screened interaction and uh, the diagrams you miss are already there at the second order, so in, in GW mix the second order exchange uh, diagram, and in fact uh, you suffer of self-interaction. That kicks in via the uh, screening, the RPA screen that is also well known in chemistry to be not self-interaction free, and actually you have uh, what is self-screening within uh, uh, GW. This was documented uh, both uh, uh, theoretically and uh, computationally. Things are instead different if you think at the case of uh, density functional theory where you don't have such information of diagrams. So somehow you have the hood of your car that is closed and you cannot access that piece of information. And in, in that case, uh, you have to recur to other uh, definitions, uh, definitions of self-interaction. Uh, one of these uh, was uh, um, the basically relying on the, uh, an exact property of the total energy as a function of the fractional number of electrons, that is piecewise linearity of the total energy, um, that is somehow connected since the derivative of the total energy with the occupation is somehow related to a, an effective eigenvalue, uh, single particle eigenvalue, so somehow the fact that total energy is piecewise linear means that these eigenvalues do not depend on their own occupation. That again is a concept related to self-interaction. Still is not the very same definition, uh, such that the artery foc uh, that is total, totally self-interaction free from a diagrammatic point of view is not self-interaction free in the sense of piecewise linearity. Still, in density functional theory is somehow the only thing you can do. You, you can only define total energy, uh, self-interaction in, in, in that framework. Uh, in general, as, uh, this was uh, referred by, I think, uh, Purdue uh, groups at least, uh, as uh, uh, many-body 
uh, and body self-interaction uh, freedom. And to me, that is the, so the proper definition, density functional theory of, uh, of self-interaction is still an open uh, options. There are several uh, proposals there. If I may add uh, <coughs> a very simple uh, old man's uh, compliment to what, uh, what uh, Andrea just said. Uh, <coughs> It's not very, uh, very rigorous, very theoretical, but to me, uh, the self-interaction error is the name you give to the feature of your theory that makes uh, the energy of the hydrogen atom different from one Rydberg. Hmm? So if you have uh, a, compl a complex theory, such as many body theory, the minimum requirement of the, or density function theory or whatever, quantum chemistry, you name it, um, couple clusters, anything. Uh, the minimum requirement uh, you have with uh, such a complex theory is that it, it can solve uh, the problems that you could solve uh, without uh, that theory. Unfortunately, none of those complex theory can solve one body problems. You don't need them in those cases, but it would be relieving if you could. Huh? And uh, so this is not a definition, but um, but if you do density functional theory for uh, ordinary, of course, uh, uh, Holmberg and Cohn say that you do density functional theory for uh, one electron, it gives the, the right result. It's a theorem. But current implementations of density functional theory applied to one body uh, problems, to one electron problems, give the wrong the wrong uh, uh, energy. The name you give to the mistake uh, you make uh, is self-interaction error. So a little bit uh, um, a step further in elaboration is coming to what uh, the other Andrea said uh, in, uh, in uh, his lecture, that uh, this, uh, this theory is uh, Hartree-Fock and uh, density functional like are uh, mean field theory or mean field like Hartree Fock is indeed mean field uh, density functional is not but it has the form of uh, of a mean field theory uh, which means that you can attribute uh, physical properties to individual electrons which you cannot in a truly interacting system uh, so that you can uh, uh, you can speak uh, of properties of individual electrons in mean field theories uh, so you are tempted uh, to treat one electron at a time uh, as you would do in, uh, for an hydrogen atom, for a one electron. Formally, mathematically, they are the same. Uh, elaborating a little bit more, so the self-interaction error in density functional theory and uh, in many body perturbation theory and in any sophisticated theory is the relic, the relics, what remains of the original sin of uh, those uh, uh, theories that fail uh, for the hydrogen atom. Okay, so um, how do we do? I mean, I have to do correlation, then we, it takes 15 minutes to do correlation, then we go for the coffee break. Or because now is so what time is it now? Now is it's ten thirty now. Ten thirty or is the plan? Coffee, coffee break. We do coffee break and then we do correlation. Eh? Okay. Okay. Okay.